My guest today is Canadian musician and composer Sarah Devachi, whose music explores texture and minimalism using mainly organs and analog synthesizers. I'd like to start by asking you a little bit about how you feel your music gets labelled, because words like meditative and hypnotic are always thrown at it, and I came at, came towards it through sort of electronic music and things on NTS radio and stuff like that. Um, whereas after reading about what you do, it has a lot more in common with contemporary classical music and things like that in the way that you write it. Um, so how do you feel about the words that people use to describe your music? Yeah, that's kind of a loaded question, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things I, I feel I could say about that. I mean... I guess in like a concrete way, there are certain words that I don't like being used in relationship to my music just because I don't hear it that way. Like ambient is kind of the, the one that doesn't bother me necessarily and I don't, like the genre itself doesn't intrinsically bother me or anything like that. It's just my understanding of ambient music is not in line with what my intentions are for my own music which is more about close listening or like deep listening um and to me it just that doesn't feel like the right descriptor um and i think there are a lot of words that get thrown around for whatever reason um partially i guess because you know people just have their own reactions on the surface level and they get out of it what they get out of it and whether that's what i intended or not doesn't really matter in the end um so yeah, for me personally, it, it helps to, to have those things clearer in my mind, knowing how I want the music from my end to exist and what I want it to mean for me. Um, but yeah, it's a complicated thing. It's, it's tricky because it, at the end of the day, even when people are talking about your music, which is nice, um, it can feel a bit deflating when they seem to be kind of missing the point or misunderstanding things that were important to you when you were working on the music. Um, yeah, so that can be frustrating sometimes. Does it happen in the other way where you might read a review of your work or speak to someone who's listened to it and they completely understand what you're doing and they're kind of excited about, you know, having completely understood what you tried to do when you were writing it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's like the best feeling when... I mean, again, it's it's complicated because I don't want necessarily... I think that would be kind of boring if like the artist, the person making the, the work had one specific intention in mind and that was the only thing that people got out of it. That's not how I want my work to exist either. Um, but it is really nice when there are specific things that you feel like you're doing and you do read that like somebody gets it or like somebody and, and often I don't think it's like I don't think it's hard to get there. I think it's just a matter of the listener putting in the time to be able to like and the attention or the care I guess to to actually figure out what's going on as opposed to just sort of glossing over things um, but yeah that's that's a really nice feeling <laughs> when that happens. If we go back to your childhood what sort of music were you listening to then it'd be interesting to see what you were listening to and how that slowly took shape into the kind of music you make now is there a is there a lineage there? Yeah, I mean, it was kind of all over the place when I was a kid because I have um, two siblings that are a fair bit older than me. Um, so I, I think early on, like as a kid, I I inherited a lot of the music that they were listening to. And like, you know, my brother was like really into like classic rock. He grew up in the 70s and it was like this very prevalent thing in my household when I was growing up. Um and as a teenager, I think I learned to appreciate different types of that music or like different parts of that music in, in my own way, um, which I still care about. And I, you know, I think a lot of that is evident on, um, like I have a show that I DJ on uh, NTS, um, a monthly show that I play a lot of stuff like that and a lot of stuff that's tangential to it um, that I think I wouldn't have developed as close of a 
Mm. Or like a different kind of understanding if I wasn't listening to it early on before having any like preconceptions about what it meant or anything like that. Um, but yeah, I also grew up playing piano. I, I played classical piano. So that really informed a lot of my comfort level, I guess, with that world of music and being able to, I don't know, um, I guess just extract from it what I thought was interesting and, and leave other things behind that weren't as interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess when I was younger, I was, I was exposed to a lot of different kinds of music, which I think is, I would recommend to anybody who makes music to just listen to different kinds of music, even if it's not the kind of music that you're making. For me, I was able to like, like I said, like sort of pick out things and different types of music that were interesting to me that maybe are not obvious in the music that I make, but that have been there in my mind while making it. You mentioned that your music, you write it um, intended for deep and close listening for sort of full attention. And uh, can you speak to any experiences that you've had with other music that makes you feel that way or is something that sort of triggered a need in you to make music like that? Yeah, I remember um, like when I was first starting to think about making music or like think about composition in a more um, formalized way, I was a teenager and I was still playing piano and I was, I just didn't have any of the tools or like framework for thinking about how I wanted to make the kind of music that I was interested in, but I remember being drawn, like I would, you know, I'd be playing piano, playing a piece on the piano, and I'd hit like a chord that I thought was really beautiful, and I wanted to just stop and hear that chord for a longer time, and just let it, just listen to it for a while. And in that kind of music, you're so often just moving past things and not really actually listening in that way. And so I was aware of that desire earlier on, but I didn't have any structure of thinking about it or thinking about how to make it. Um, and then I remember when I started at Mills College when I was doing my master's degree, um, it was like the very first day of school. I was taking a composition seminar in Just Intonation. And on the first day, um, we went into the classroom and the professor, um, who was Chris Brown, was playing um, Lamont Young's uh, The Second Dream of the High Tension Line Step Down Transformer. I think that's what it is. Uh, and it was just playing when we all walked in. So we all sat down, nobody said anything, and we just listened to it for like probably half an hour. And I remember having like a, a realization like this is, this is it. This is the kind of music that I've been imagining. This is the kind of musical experience that I've been wanting. And it's possible and, and just having that awareness that it is something that I could actually do, that it wasn't just this weird idea that, you know, was just going to live in my head for the rest of my life. Um, yeah. So it was, it was coming into an awareness of that sort of music that really slows down and like focuses on, on harmony and texture as the actual musical material, as opposed to melody or rhythm or, or things like that. It's interesting that you say, you really are drawn to the sustained chords and things like that because I find that's what I like about your music I like that you sort of settle into a harmon harmonic relationship or something and the way that it moves is very gentle and slow but I thought something that stuck out to me I listened to a few of your older albums um, and you've got a song on there called Auster on a song on an album called Gave in Rest mm -hmm. and it has these quite abrupt breaks in it mm. and that sort of seems to go against a lot of your other music and what you're talking about at the moment so what was uh, what was behind the decision to break it up like that yeah um that's funny with that piece because it's you know for somebody who does music that's very based in like long tones and held tones and sustained sound um it is kind of a meaningful it's it's more meaningful to have moments of silence than in other types of music where silence is is just kind of part of it um and i remember uh i think like a lot of the best ideas that i have anyway or like that other people maybe have just kind of come out of nowhere and you don't really know what it was that made you think of it or what it was that led you to it but just one day you're like oh i should try this and I had that moment with that piece where I was listening to these different harmonies. I was putting them together. Um, and 
I remember trying to think of like how the piece could be structured and it just kind of came to me where I was like, what if I just have these blocks of sound and then they stop and they kind of cycle through in this way that, that still has the same pacing and the sense of, of time that I try to do with, with the sustained sounds, um, but just incorporating silence as a part of it. And yeah, so that just kind of came to me, but the, the, that way of incorporating silence um, is still something that I, I do a lot and is still interesting to me. And it's funny uh, speaking of, you know, people misunderstanding <laughs> what you're doing. Um, I remember, I think it was maybe the record after that or something, it was one of the records after that, uh, that I read a review where somebody said something like, um, Sarah already used silence once before. <laughs> Like, why is she using it again? Which I thought was such a strange thing <laughs> to like, like silence, you're only allowed to do it once, you know? Um, which is really, that was just very strange to me that, that that's yeah. how somebody heard it. But yeah, so um, I, it's still, I, and I think about that too, like with, with this type of music, with like whatever quote unquote drone music, um, that there is like a an idea of it being just this never ending sound, but I don't think it has to be. I think it can exist in a lot of different ways and it can incorporate repetition and different patterns as well as silence. Um, yeah, and I think I think it's interesting to think about it in sort of a, a macro sense as opposed to just, oh, it's, it's sustained sound and that's what a drone is. A lot of music, especially yours, I find is the effect it has on me is very emotional and sort of visceral mm. but the way you're studying it and the way you speak about it is especially as it's linked in with your studies is is very academic and practical and there's a lot of science that goes into it and I'd like to kind of know if you approach your compositions with more of more of an intuitive or a sort of mathematic approach like how do you start a piece do you sit there and and play around until you find something or is it, is it do you write out your music before how does that um balance work yeah. in the music yeah um that's a good question uh I was actually talking about it with a student yesterday um and yeah it's definitely for me um I come at it from a more intuitive perspective I mean there's definitely like the you know the mathematics or whatever the structure behind things the more formalized things are there up front, like usually when I start a piece, I'll, I'll have some sense of the general structure or tuning or whatever, the things that I kind of want to incorporate into it. But those things are never, um, like I don't, if, if something's not working in the piece as I'm working on it, I'm, I'm always gonna choose what sounds good or to me, as opposed to like sticking to some imaginary rule that I've made up for myself. Um, so it's always, at the end of the day for me, it always comes down to the sound. And, and if something doesn't sound good, I'm gonna change it, even if it breaks a rule or something that I was trying to adhere to. Um, it usually works out pretty well that I can have that kind of basic structure to work in. And then from there, it's just the same kind of process of, of just trying things out and, and finding something that I like and then following that path. Um, but I was saying this to my student yesterday that um, I remember one of the best pieces of advice that I got um, from Maggie Payne, who was my professor at Mills, um, was that she said that any like tool that you use to create your music should always be transparent. Like you should, it should be there and it can guide things, but it should never be something that's like, um, that can be perceived by the listener it should always kind of be in service of of the music itself and the sound um which i think about a lot uh and i think i i adhere to that a lot when i make music um yeah i think yeah i find a lot of music that uses things tools and structures and things like that but the, the thing that you just saying that made me think of is that there's a song by tool which is the time signature works in the same way as the Fibonacci sequence. Mm. And I think that is like, a, is a gimmick. I think that's kind mm -hmm. of just because you can do that doesn't mean you should. I don't think it serves mm -hmm. the song or anything. I think yeah. it's just sort of a very strange way of showing off. Yes, um, <laughs> I agree. So I, I think, yeah, I think it's good that, yeah, the sort of the idea of serving a song or a piece is, is much more, 
impressive than saying oh well yeah look we've um written a song that's in eight different you know time signatures and changes mode every bar or something it's you know it's um I, d- I don't I don't really know what that's in aid of that kind of songwriting but yeah yeah I mean I think like having restrictions can be good and, and can be helpful but again like I don't know when I when I work on music like especially towards the end of like when I'm getting towards what I think will be the end of the the piece that I'm working on usually I just I listen to it so many times and if there's even like a moment that sounds wrong to me or just something doesn't sit right I stop and I try to figure it out and I try to fix it and and do something different so it's yeah to me I can't imagine like having a piece of music that followed a rule but that I didn't like you know I'm not saying that that's a bad thing for to exist you know for that type of music to exist but for me I just I can't imagine being okay with saying like well I don't like how this sounds but (laughs) it's following this process so there you go I wanted to ask a little bit about how it works with performance something that's meant to be an intimate close listening experience when you're performing in a space that's the opposite of that to a room full of people mm-hmm. you know have you have have you do you have much say in the venues that you perform in and is there somewhere that you sticks in your mind as being the perfect sort of location to perform the music that you make can you speak a little bit about what that's like yeah i sometimes joke um when i'm doing a sound check like if i have a sound check that goes particularly well i sometimes joke that the perfect venue is an empty one <laughs> Um, which is obviously, uh, just a joke, not, not realistic, but, um, yeah, I mean, I do, especially now, I think, um, early on, I I don't think I had any control necessarily over where I played. Um, but I think now, especially people understand the kinds of spaces that work well for that sort of music. So they already, if they're trying to promote a show, they already sort of sort of have that in mind, um, ahead of time. But, you know, I, I, And it's really hard to control all of these kinds of things um, or even to try. But uh, I do have some restrictions on things like um, I tend not to play in bars and and things like that where the atmosphere is already inherently social and people talking and and that sort of thing. Um, I have it in my rider that like if there's a bar in the venue, it should be closed while the show is happening, Um, (laughs) which I'd say 50 50 people adhere to that and they don't (laughs) um but yeah I mean I you know I I think the more you play in the kinds of spaces that work well the more people um are like privy to to trying to book those sorts of things like churches I play in churches quite a lot um or like concert halls that have the the right kind of setting um it's funny because concert halls and churches kind of have like opposite acoustics um so there's certain types of music. I think my music actually works better in churches where it's meant to kind of blend together and, and bring out harmonics and overtones and things like that. Whereas in concert halls, it kind of prevents those things. It, it It's designed to remove those kinds of um, extraneous sounds that are a part of my music. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's hard, um, but it's fun to like... Um, you know, every show I think is kind of just, it, it ends up being what it is and you can't really predict it. Like some shows that you think are going to be good end up being terrible for whatever reason. And some that you think aren't going to be anything special end up being quite, um, memorable and, and sounding quite good. And it's the same with different rooms and different audiences. Um, yeah, so it's, it's fun to, to try different spaces and, and play with different people and, and have all of those different experiences. Cause they're, for the most part, they're all good. It's, it's the, uh, like exception, the rare exception when there are bad, um, concerts from my perspective. Uh, yeah, but it's just, everyone is different. And I think that's part of it. Uh, part of the enjoyment as well is that it just, it's, it's a different experience that's unique to that moment which is nice definitely i was looking at your tour dates on your website and saw that there's a performance of your music here in my city in bristol oh Um, yeah and it's in it's in a local you know like a quite a small church Mm -hmm. and it's um and it's being played sort of mid-morning on the on Mm. a saturday 
mm-hmm. which I like all of those things surprised me. And then um, oh. also to see that it's it's not actually you performing, you're not part of the performance, they're just performing your piece, which made me want to know when that's happening, do you have, do you sort of sign off on the people who play your music? Do they come to you or do you go to them? How does it work when you have other people performing your pieces? Yeah, that's a slightly newer thing that I've been doing. I mean, um, especially in terms of like, that's an organ piece, which when I wrote it um, and even notated it, I didn't have as much of an expectation of other people playing it. But of course, when you notate it, you're doing it for the purpose of other people being able to play it. So it's something that I've got become more interested in over the last couple of years of having trusting people to, to play my music. And it's, it's more than trust. It's, it's, um, you know, it's that aspect of interpretation and, you know, I kind of create the boundaries of the sound, but then other players are going to interpret it in their own way. And every time it's going to be something different. And it's, it's interesting to see how other people interpret things, especially with, um, the way that I notate most of my music leaves certain things open-ended um, where the players can make decisions about things. And, and that's really interesting to me. So, um, but yeah, it's almost like the opposite of my early work was very like, you know, studio fixed, like that's it. Like there's nobody's performing it and that's the only version of it that exists. And I've kind of almost gone the opposite of, of keeping these things more open. Um, precisely with that that idea of uh, iteration and variation in mind. Um, yeah, so when when those kinds of things happen, I mean, so far it's it's people that I know who approach me about playing it. Um, so in all those cases, I do trust that that it is in good hands, you know, and I'm fine to pass it along. And usually there's a bit of um, a little bit of back and forth about questions about the score or interpretation or anything like that um through email or whatever uh which is nice to be able to to clarify things or you know just talk about different possibilities um yeah so it's for now yeah it's it's all people that that i know um who are doing it but it is interesting to think about you know things just being completely outside of my hands which i like it's it's interesting to to hear the things that you're thinking come through to be communicated in this very like abstract way through a score to other people and to kind of be on that same, in that same place, in that same mental space. Um, yeah, that's really like interesting to me lately. Have you been able to see any of those performances? Have you sat in the audience and watched other people play your music? Mm-hmm. Yeah, a couple times, not as much as I'd like. Um, I mean, I love the idea that my music can be performed in places where I don't have the the time or the means to travel to that's like a really nice aspect of it um but yeah there have been a couple times where i've been able to actually sit and listen um which is a strange experience but it's amazing because you know 99% of the time when i'm performing my own music often i'm sitting in like the worst place for it like i'm sitting behind the speakers with monitors or i'm sitting at the organ which is like the worst place <laughs> to actually hear what the organ's doing in the space you know um so it's it's nice and that part of it um is actually quite meaningful to me to be able to sit in the room and 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 hear it as a listener and to be able to think about it in that way and and how that affects my future approaches to composing similar kinds of things knowing how it's actually perceived in the space um yeah and it's it's fun to just be able to like trust people and have them have them play your music and and have it be after the fact in a in a different way than like if you make a record and then people are listening to it without you intervening in any way when you your work is already done um it's still there's like this living aspect of it still that i think is is interesting yeah so do you find that when you're watching that the little differences between the way you would perform it and the way that they do is that you find yourself that you usually enjoy that or do you find that you know find yourself saying or thinking i wish they'd stuck to the script a little bit more closely or you're sort of happy to see it take on its own life a bit yeah i mean the way that i compose um the things that i'm particular about i am very clear in the score that those should be a particular way and the things that are like part of the piece um 
that are choices that the performers can make those are the things that like i said they're already a part of the piece so those are the things that i'm i'm intentionally leaving up to chance more or less um yeah so i haven't come across anything yet that's like bothered me in the way that um other people have have interpreted things because it yeah i feel like i've been able to find that balance that works for me of of being clear about what is important to me and then being open about the things that i want to be open Sarah, what would you like to offer up as your Who's Flying the Plane hidden gem? Uh, so the thing that I've been doing a lot of reading for my um, PhD, for my dissertation, and um, I started when I was in school, I, I started in philosophy and kind of worked my way into... Um, a way of talking about music and sound from a phenomenological perspective that's been really interesting to me and I, I think about it separate from my own music but also in my own music as well and um, a few years ago I took a seminar on um, music and like ecstatic experience music and ecstasy essentially and there was a whole wealth of ideas um, this is like a comparative survey of like the way that different cultures throughout time have connected with sound in a not necessarily like spiritual way, like definitely in a spiritual way, but also in, in secular, um, just more like psychological ways, um, which has been really interesting to me when I think about sound more generally and, and when I make music. Um, and one of the books that I came across during that time um, was called The Varieties of Religious Experience by William James. Um, I think it's like a pretty fairly well-known book amongst people who like already are kind of in that, that sphere uh, of thinking about, you know, pseudo-spiritual experiences. Um, but what I like about this book, I mean, despite the title uh, of it, explicitly saying religious experience um, is that I think there's a lot in it that is uh, to me I read it from a more secular perspective that there's a lot about just like basic aesthetic experience or experiences in the world that um, the w just the way that we connect with these kinds of experiences um, can be viewed in a lot of different ways and can have a lot of meanings that I think people tend to overlook in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's been like a really, I don't know, it's, it's had a big impact on me in, in my like personal life, but also in my musical life as well. Thanks a lot for taking the time to talk to me today, Sarah. Yeah, thank you for asking me. Mm -hmm.